All right. No, no, I wasn't recording yet. Um, hello, um, people at home watching. Um, I hope you're having fun. No, I hope you did well on your AMC. B. Um, we're having class now, and here's what we're doing: all the things. So, um, like I was already saying, people are laughing at me. That is allowed. Um, what uh, are all the things? Well, we're like pretty much done with chapter three now, kind of. Except Don is like, you know, depends on how you count done. Um, do we all, we have finished learning, but we probably haven't finished learning, you know? Uh, because we have to know everything, and you probably don't know everything because it's all really hard. So let's just rewind, we're gonna recap everything, but this time we're gonna fill in lots of like loose ends, a little bit of repetition, a little bit of going over some homework problems that we never went over before. Are you ready, people in the room? Ah. Woo. Woo! Those are good. Those are some good noises. Let's start with Thursday, 11:02. Can someone take a peek in the camera and make sure it's like doing what we think it's doing? It's counting up, so yeah. All right. Um. Good. So. Um, people live in the room, because you're the people that really matter, because who's going to watch this video anyway? Maybe some people will. Um, section 3.3 was all about Mikel points. I think this was one of the hardest sections in the entire book, mainly because of bad writing um, by Coxeter. And this is all happening on page 62. I have finally summarized every single thing that happened on page 62 with text, diagrams, and explanations. Um, a lot of this is like more than what we really did in class, but you know, um, here's what you need to do. So this is what we did on the day. This is, here I'm recapping that day. This was that day when grades were due, and I was like kind of grading something over here a little bit, and you guys like worked on the package. Do you remember this day? <coughs> um, all right, so first of all, there's the original diagram. The original basic diagram that we've talked about 10 times, but let's talk about it one more time, is that if you give me an arbitrary triangle ABC and you uh, construct triangles on the sides of ABC such that the remote angles add up to 180, then the, um, the three circles all meet at this point uh, F. And um, okay, we can, just because why not, what else do we have to do? Um, we can just even just do the argument one more time. That's not what I was expecting. Why is it so weird? Um, hold on a sec. Um, whoa. Why, um, why is everything so weird? Let's try this again. Reload. Um, all right, we have some technical problems. The technical problems is that everything looks really stupid. Can anyone figure out why that's so? Maybe it's because you're too far in the Yeah. No, but like. Maybe control lines. No, but. Like but the actual screen, the GeoGebra itself, like. No, but I don't think that's the issue because look how everything's like nice. Everything's like no, fat and weird looking. Yeah, control minus. I know, but it wouldn't let me. No, it's, it's like, like not like doing the way normal the, control like, minus like is supposed to go. On top, like put on the URL, it's like URL bar. Uh huh. And yeah. it's like, yeah, it's like, and then I will like click off the highlighting and just that, uh, yes. Yeah. All right, good. This is a riveting video so far. Okay, good. So wait, why is this? Why is this true? Can we do this? Can we just do this whole argument in like one minute? Um, what should we do? I suppose we should hide one of the circles. Which circle do you want to hide? How about the green one? Excellent suggestion. Okay. Uh, where's the green circle? Nobody knows. Oh, because it's not green. So that's why I got confused there. Dun, dun, dun. Where are you, little circle? Maybe just use the hide tool. That's a much better idea. Look at this kind of class participation that's going on here. Hide. Um, thanks, Jason. Yeah, so we'll hide that tool and we'll like, maybe we'll just like hide that angle also for a second and then we just just talk it out um what is there to talk out we can even do we can even do this kind of stuff if we want to yeah 
um, because I'm getting so good at this pen now. Um, so uh, what, what can we do? We can call this angle like alpha. We can call this angle like beta. We can call this angle gamma. And then, of course, uh, we construct the circle um, uh, through the, the, the circumcircle for ACQ. And we construct the circumcircle for PVC. They uh, meet at point F. Then, because of cyclic quads, this is 180 minus uh, alpha, and this is 180 minus beta. And then what's this angle here? Well, it's like 360 minus 180 minus alpha minus 180 minus beta. Terrible handwriting, but um, what do we end up with when you clear all that up? Alpha plus beta. Alpha plus beta. Um, so therefore, this is alpha plus beta. And uh, what we know is that uh, alpha plus beta plus gamma adds up to 180. Therefore, this angle is supplementary to gamma. And therefore, um, if you have a quadrilateral in which opposite angles are supplementary, then uh, it's a cyclic quad. And therefore, this is a cyclic quad. And therefore, there's a circle that goes through A, R, B, and F. And therefore, the circle through A, B, and R also passes through F. Woo! How are we doing? We are doing so well, Mr. Ruth. Thank you. All this repetition is really helping me solidify my understanding. Good job, people at home. Yeah. All right, so that's like one down. What else? Um, hey, I hope you all agree that this figure is sufficiently... Um, General that there um, that this is going to just hold, you know, in all cases. In particular, what if you have? I don't think I did this particular this exact move in class any one of the five times we went over this theorem. So now is a good time. What if I? Sh what if it should just happen to be that A, R, and Q are collinear? And what if it should happen to be? that P, C, and B, and Q are collinear, and that P, B, and R are collinear. Does everyone agree that the theorem will still hold? Yes. OK. Therefore, in this case, by a change of uh, perspective, we can see that really there's just like a triangle PQR. OK, so that is the next way in which we generalize what's going on here. Now we um, think, of their, think of ourselves as starting with a triangle, uh, A, B, C, and then uh, that's corresponding to the sort of big triangle. And then the, uh, the three points of the original triangle are now just three points, A, B, and C, that happen to lie on the sides of that triangle. Okay, we've done this five times. Um, so uh, what are A1 is an arbitrary point on B, C, B1 is an arbitrary point on A, C, C1 is an arbitrary point on A, B, and then the, all the same logic as before holds and everything's all good. Woo, got a thumbs up from Jason. I called this baby 3.32. Okay, then... Um, there is this other theorem, we've also talked about this five times, that says, hey, build um, triangles uh, on the sides of triangle ABC, but this time do it in a way that the triangles are all similar to each other. And in particular, similar in a kind of a cyclic kind of way, uh, cyclically permute the sort of order of the similarities such that um, Q, R, and P end up being the, the, the three angles of that similar triangle. Um, and therefore you get, because, um, because P, Q, and R uh, are the three angles of the similar triangle, they automatically have 180. And so the, the um, requirements of the, the conditions of the original theorem are met. And therefore, also, we get the intersection at the McKell point. Cool? Good. Nothing more deep to say about that for the moment. Then, Coxeter, on page 62, I know we did this all two weeks ago, but we're just doing it again, says that, um, hey, there's no reason why the arbitrary points A1, B1, C1 need to be on the sides of the angle. Uh, on the sides of the triangle, they can also be off the angle. And in uh, this day, November 2nd, uh, you guys got this packet. The packet was fun. You did the packet. You worked on it. You seemed to be all successful. In this particular diagram, we actually did this in class. Yes? I think we switched from calling the A1, B1, and C1 something else to A1, B1. What was, what was it again that we were calling for? One more time? I think we switched from calling A1, or A1, B1, and C1 from something else. 
Yeah, somewhere around here I made the switch because once we once we decided to look at the specific case in which the um, remote angles are not just any remote. Basically, once you lock in, okay, once you lock in these three points as being collinear, as seen in this diagram right now. Now we're kind of in a different. Now we're in a different territory. Now we are choosing to explore. Uh, things from the perspective of the original triangle PQR being like where we start and then the other three points as being points arbitrarily taken from the sides of that triangle. So it was at that moment that we decided to change the notation to make it triangle ABC and to refer to A1, B1, C1 as the arbitrary points of the sides. Cool? Okay, good. Then we expanded this even further to include the case, cases in which the arbitrarily chosen point from side BC, for example, might not lie on side BC, but might lie on somewhere on line BC. And then what ends up happening is um, you get a bunch of um, different, you just, it's just harder, right? You just get now um, weirder arrangements. The justification is weirder, but the, um, theorem still holds. And if you don't believe me that the theorem still holds, we could do one. Should we just do one right now? Just for, just so we're like we're doing something new? So, um, you should be able, in theory, people at home, you should be able, in theory, later, to be able to prove this for any of the many, many configurations. Now, some fancy people are just going to be like, oh, come on, it's all just one case. But just because it might be one case, like in theory, doesn't mean that your brain is going to process it as just one case. Follow? To me, each one of the individual proofs feels totally different, and I have to think all over again, like how, why it's true and how it's true and stuff. So let me just randomly just drag B1 like over there somewhere, and now let's just like see what happens. Can we do the proof from this position? I don't know. Um, so let's try to do it. Um, name a circle that we should hide. Orange. Orange, good. Um, so Jason just says hide the orange. And now, um, does everyone understand the task? Task, show that in this particular configuration where uh, B1 was chosen uh, on somewhere on line AC and A1 was chosen somewhere on line BC but not on the side, um, in this particular configuration we must show that the orange circle uh, passes through, well, um, in this video that I dug up from three years ago, I, I was doing a really good job of stating the sort of theorem uh, in words, which I think I also did in our class, but I maybe only did it like once. In words, um, to me it's helpful to say what this theorem is doing in words. In words, what it says is, the circle through any vertex of the triangle and the two arbitrarily chosen points from the sides of the triangle meeting at that point. So there's a triangle through A, B1, C1, and there is uh, another triangle, uh, sorry, circle through, uh, a circle through A, B1, C1, and there should be another circle through B and the two arbitrarily chosen points from the sides of angle B. Okay, that's just a way of keeping track if you're finding it difficult uh, it's just a way of keeping track of which uh, are the circles even. And so here, once things get a little bit weirder, um, you can sort of say to yourself, all right, what are the circles again? Well, there is supposed to be a green circle. What is the green circle? It's the circle through A and the two arbitrarily chosen points from the sides of angle A. And the sides of angle A are, of course, line AB and line AC. And the arbitrarily chosen point from line AB is C1, and the arbitrarily chosen point from line AC is B1. Thus, it's the circle through, through A, B1, and C1 that we, that we sort of seek. Who's that mean? Okay, so what is the, and then there's the, the circle through, through B, and then we need the circle through C. So we need to show that there's a circle through, uh, we need to show that there is a circle through C, and um, the two arbitrarily chosen points on the sides of angle C. That is A1 and um, B1. In other words, we need to show that 
uh, A one C uh, P B one is cyclic. Who agrees? I agree with myself that this is what we need to show. Okay, why? Why is it cyclic? Yeah, this is this is to oh. be shown, right? This is what we need to show to complete the, to complete the proof um, for this particular configuration. We need to show the thing that is to be shown is that the third circle also passes through P. In see? other words, that this particular it also just takes some effort even just to realize what it is that you're trying to prove this, is that this particular quadrilateral cyclic is what is what is to be proved. Can we start by labeling angles? Of course we can. Uh, angle E A C. Angle, yeah, the interior angles of the blue triangle. Right? Okay, we can call that alpha. We can call that beta, and we can call this gamma. Seems like something to do. The supplementary angle to alpha would be beta plus gamma, right? Yeah, that's actually uh, to alpha. This one over here. Mm -hmm. um, do I want that? Yes. Okay, he just says yes. So great. So that's beta plus gamma. And now you can use. Uh, inscribed angles to say that the angle B1, between B1, B1 PC1 is also beta plus gamma. B1 PC1, this angle is also beta plus mm -hmm, gamma. So true. Yes. And now you can. Oh, hey, by the way, before, wait, before I let you guys even continue, note that this um, person who made this GeoTube file kind of already took the initiative to do the one big important step. The one big important step is to connect P to each of the arbitrarily chosen points, right? Um, and then, so that's kind of already been done, but you might have to like do that yourself on a test or something, right? Because that is, recall, the overall strategy of how we even did the very first Mikel, the very first one, right? So the first step was connect P to the, okay. Uh, but anyway, I kind of slowed you guys down, but I agree that those two angles are equal because of inscribed angles. They both intercept arc B1, C1 in, um, the green circle. Then the angle C1 P A1 would be equal to alpha plus gamma because C1 it's like it's P A1 is alpha plus gamma. Why is that true? Because it's a cyclic quadrilateral. Oh, mm hmm. Uh, Wait, I got lost. Which angle? C1 P A1 is uh, supplementary to angle beta because it's cyclic by definition. Sure. Mm -hmm. So this is 180 minus beta. Is that what you said? Yes. That's yeah. Okay, sorry. 180 minus beta. Yes, because it says Jason, B C P A1 is cyclic in the purple circle. And now you can just show that beta plus gamma and plus 180 minus beta, and then plus that missing angle is 360, and then you can show that the missing angle, like B1, P, A1, is supplementary to, um, to the... Is, okay, so just show now... Maybe I should just draw in the... What's the actual quad that we're trying to show is cyclic, it's, um, what did I say, A, um, A, C, P, oops, A, 1, C, P, wait, really? A, C, P, yeah, yep, A, C, P, the way to do this one is to be one. prove that both of them are inscribed angles. Yeah, so you just have to show B1. So you guys are, this A1 is not the method I would use, but. supplementary to gamma. One more time, Pat. Just show that B1 P A1 is supplementary to gamma. B1 And P you can do that A1. by adding the three angles around P mm -hmm. and setting that equal to 180 and then solve. Okay, so you're saying like, this angle here. Uh -huh. 
So that angle is like 360 minus beta plus gamma um, minus 180 minus beta, like this? That was your plan? Yes. Okay, and so what does this turn out to be? Um, I guess it's like 180 minus gamma by algebra 1, by algebra 0, just arithmetic. And therefore, is that, are we just done now? And therefore yeah, it's... because um, angle B1CA1 also describes the same arc. If you draw the, the circumcircle around the sacred quad A1CPB1, and then, C, P. like the quad that you're trying to show is cyclic. Okay. But so wouldn't I need to show that? No. So okay. Hold we on. We basically hold on. show that the red angle is the same as the exterior angle at C, which is uh, which is supplementary uh, to gamma. So now I see what you guys are doing. That is 180 minus gamma. Okay. So basically. These two red angles are equal. Okay, so this is what. All right, so this is what um, this is what Jason and Faye did. They said that the supplement of angle C is 180 minus gamma, and so is this other angle B uh, P C, also 180 minus gamma, and therefore um, that. Um, by like some other theorem. Uh, you know, they are both intercepting the same arc in some circle that passes through all four of them. Okay, I accept. <coughs> um, not what I would have done. I thought there was maybe like a much easier way to do this, but that is a way. Woo! Um, good. Um, any questions on this before, before we kill it? Yes or no? Alright, good. I close you. Oh, it's gone. But there will be a video. All right. Um, so moving right along, pretty slowly, I might say. Um, but you know, okay. Now is where things get um, wild. Um, this we did together pretty effectively, I thought. But still, we're doing it again. <gasps> what if it should happen to be? This is how Coxeter puts it. That the Three lines, P, A1, P, um, sorry, P, A, P, B, and P, C are in fact diameters of those circumcircles. Okay, so if you want to go back to like somewhere like say here maybe is a good um, place to, um, is a good place to look. Because this is the sort of the general case in which, you know, these can be like anywhere, right? And so at this moment, does it appear that um, well, I, I could be even more weird. Does it appear here that like P A one is a diameter of the green circle? Certainly, it does not. Okay. Um, does it appear that P C is the diameter of the purple circle? Also, no. But like, if you should happen to be in that situation, so how do you actually do this? It's not so obvious how. Actually, it is kind of obvious. But if you should happen to find yourself in a situation, this is how he chooses to phrase it, such that these three lines, PA1, PB1, and PC1 are, no, sorry, P, PC, PA, and PB are diameters, then you end up with right angles. Um, in other words, does it look like these three orange angles are right angles at this moment? Like, maybe. They're close enough. Close enough? Okay, so if you should happen, if that should happen to be the case, um, that you have chosen your points A1, B1, C1 in that way, well then, um, it means that uh, if PC, for example, is the diameter of the purple circle, then P, B1, C is a right angle. So another way of putting it is, um, choose points A1, B1, C1 such that you, get, you end up with right angles. These are all equivalent ways of saying the same thing. And if those all end up being right angles, then what is P? It's the pedal point. Yes. So call back all the way to section 1.9 when we talked about pedal triangles. How does that work? You take a triangle, take an arbitrary point P, you drop perpendiculars from P to the sides of the triangle, you call P the pedal point, and you call the blue triangle the pedal triangle. Okay, so <coughs> um, therefore, 
uh, that's what he wants to consider now. This case in which, um, and this, this time the figure has been locked by construction, so that I have essentially just um, taken an arbitrary point P, you can see that's blue, and for this arbitrary point P, I have now basically constructed the pedal triangle. So this is the exact same pedal triangle construction from section 1.9. Take a triangle, take an arbitrary point P, drop perpendiculars, blah, blah, blah. The only new thing that we're adding is um, that the circumcircles all meet at that pedal point. So in other words, if it should happen to be that you have chosen A1, B1, and C1 in a certain way so that you get right angles, then you can say a new sentence, which is that the Mikkel point is just the pedal point. Okay. Nothing so fancy going on there yet. And something I forgot to do in class is to mention that this is true even if the pedal point is not in the interior of the triangle but in the exterior of the triangle. So here is a situation in which the pedal point is outside. Well, okay, if the pedal point is outside, then of course the feet of the perpendiculars to the triangle will lie not on the sides of the triangle, but will lie on the lines through the sides of the triangle. But this has already been subsumed under the 3.32 extended case that we've been considering. I got a thumbs up from Jason. I'm so happy. Okay, so what was the other thing that happened in section 1.9? In section 1.9, we also mentioned that you're always going to get a pedal triangle, except when are you not going to get a pedal triangle? There's one time when the pedal triangle is degenerate, when P is on the circumcircle, and when does that happen? When it's on the circumcircle. Yeah, when P is on the circumcircle, and then what do you get instead? The Simpson line. The Simpson line. Okay, so we're calling back to all the things, right? A Simpson line just is a degenerate pedal triangle. It's the pedal triangle that you get when P happens to lie in the circumcircle. Bob? Okay, so don't be so shocked if we're suddenly talking about Simpson lines in a second, because if we're talking about pedal triangles, then Simpson lines are a special case of a pedal triangle in a kind of a way. Okay, um, but moving along, going through his paragraphs kind of one sentence at a time, this is the figure that I just drew where P is outside the circle. Okay, so now, where were you good? River is good. River is the best of us. Okay, good. River is dreaming about geometry. Okay, then we said, all right, then says Coxeter, hey, um, let's just try something new. Because, after all, um, the pedal triangle is just the triangle where you happen to drop perpendiculars. But what if you dropped other things? Okay, what does that mean? Well, um, if you change this to zero, we're back at the exact figure we had from a minute ago. But I think I said this like with five minutes left in the period or something on um, on that day uh, on that day November second. But I thought it was enough time. Uh, he says, "Hey, we could do some like rotations, and by that, what we're going to do is rotate in a kind of a certain sort of way um, these points A1, B1, C1." Specifically, what we're going to do is to keep the angular spacing between um, P, uh, B1, P, um, uh, P, uh, P, B1, uh, P, A1, and P, C1 intact, and then just like rotate. Okay, so if you change this to like, you know, 10 degrees or something, no, that's not enough, 15, um, then, yeah, or more. More looks good. Okay, now what do we have? Well, we have three new lines, and these three green lines uh, are sort of three rays, so to speak, you know, starting at P. And uh, the angular spacing among the three green rays is the same as the angular spacing among the three blue rays. Okay, this was Coxeter's initial presentation. He said rotate. In other words, um, these three angles kind of by construction are equal. Okay, and when these three angles by construction are equal, you're going to get uh, these three uh, green rays, and they will hit the sides of the triangle somewhere. And let's let those points of intersection, um, A1, B2, and C2, A2, B2, and C2, be the vertices of a new green triangle. What can we say about this uh, green triangle? Well, he calls this an oblique pedal triangle. And um, 
Okay, what can we observe about this oblique pedal triangle? Well, because um, C1, B1, and A1 are the feet of the perpendiculars, and since these three red angles are all equal by construction, then what you end up with are these three right triangles, do you see them? That are all similar to each other, because they each have a red angle and a right angle in them. Thus, as marked, you get these three blue angles that are equal. And why is that relevant? Um, oh, yeah. And so since these uh, three blue, yeah, shows this is kind of almost a direct proof, actually. Yeah. Because since those blue angles are equal, then based on this construction, like this is supplementary to the blue. And so this is kind of like a proof, actually, that um, these circles all meet at the Macau point. Uh, is that true? Uh, wait, well, what, what the hell was I getting at there? Uh, there's a couple things I wanted to say. One of the things I wanted to say, what Coxeter says is, everything still continues to be true, or something like that. And by that he means, uh, it's still true that, what is still true? It's still true that the uh, circumcircles, basically what he wants to be true, is that now taking A2, B2, and C2 to be the three arbitrarily chosen points, then you still get the circles through uh, all meeting at, at P. Okay, I think, someone check my logic here, I think that that just follows automatically, right? Because it's just a special case of things we've already considered. But I think that they meet at, that the, that the Mikkel point for these three R triggers is P, is perhaps not immediately clear by simply citing the Macau points theorem. Do I have that logic correct? I think so. Yeah. I think so. But in fact, it is P. And why is it P? Um, well, it's because um, it just is true. Because um, as um, uh, some people were already saying, that's blue and that's blue. But then the supplement of blue is like the supplement of the blue. So that shows kind of directly that these four quadrilaterals are all cyclic. Did everyone follow that? I didn't explain that perfectly. But A, B2, P, C2 is automatically a cyclic quad uh, because, of, because of the fact that the three blues are equal. So the supplements of the blues are opposite angles of the various quads. Want me to say that again? Yes. Take the following quadrilateral. C2. In fact, I could even hide all the circles for a second. Just B2, so. P, A, 2, C, right? And B2, A, 2, C, that's the supplement. No. P, A, 2, C, that's the supplement to the blue angle, right? Special no, what's also the right angle? Pattern. I could, but I'm even too lazy for that. C, right? Well, all right, whatever. So Special then, writing pen. B2, P, A, 2, C is a simple quad. So then the blue is a supplement to the supplement of the blue. Okay, good. I hear people saying, like, yeah, 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 the sound of learning. That little red angle is the supplement of a blue, yeah? Because it just is. But then that makes, um, that makes A, uh, C, 2, P, B, 2 also a cyclic quad because its opposite angles are supplementary. That's what you, that's what you were just saying, right? Cool. That was my only point. I close, you know. And so, indeed, you get that, I guess the claim, therefore, is that the Mikkel point, that there is a Mikkel point for the oblique uh, pedal triangle is guaranteed because the three points were constructed to be on the sides of the triangle. But that the Mikkel point is the pedal point is what we have just learned. Yes? How is this like, useful? It seems very, like, How is this useful? It seems kind of obscure, yeah. Um, I guess it's not so important, honestly. It, does, it gets about one line in Coxeter, but still, it's one line that we now understand. Hey, also, um, is it necessary to go into this weird tortured language of rotating? No. You could give a more dry, um, static uh, characterization of oblique pedal triangle. Ready? Now, instead of taking an arbitrary point P and dropping perpendiculars to the three sides of a triangle, I shall drop three um, 56 degree angles, so to speak. But there's, there's six possible. No, wait. Okay, don't get into all that kind of weird stuff. Just, just do it in a norm. Just, okay, okay, okay. Yeah. Yeah, so in other words, in other words, you could 
um, not think of the, the green triangle as being a result of some rotation, but simply take a point P and define um, uh, B2, C2, and A2 to be points on the side such that um, like P, C2, A is of some certain angle, which in this case, because the, because the, um, the red is 34, then the blues are 56. Get it? So you're dropping a certain, you're, you're constructing segments that meet the sides of a triangle at a certain angle. Okay, and I think that's what I said. If anyone read all these write-ups like Sunday night, that's exactly what I said. I hope I did. Um, yeah, I just rambled on and on. Coxeter calls triangle A to be an oblique pedal triangle. In fact, for triangle ABC, an arbitrary oblique pedal point P, and given some arbitrary angle, here it would be the blue angle, let's call it beta, you can define A2, B2, and C2 as the points on yeah, as the points on the sides of ABC where the three rays uh, P, C2, P, A2, and P, B2 make angle theta with the sides of triangle ABC. Okay, Alex is complaining that that's not exactly perfect because you would have to like have them all go pointing in the same direction, so to speak, but we could fix that up with like more annoying language. Okay, so um, anyway, get it? All right, great, moving on. All right, this is the part that we did not do properly. I am sure of it. Um, this is a further special case of theorem 3.32. And perhaps it is worth returning to the like generic 3.32, like um, here. Um, so this is the theorem 3.32 extended. Okay, so since this um, configuration applies like always, it should also apply in the special case <coughs> where the three points A1, B1, and C1 are collinear. I believe that is the only requirement. Okay, so let's just make it collinear. Okay, if you make A1, B1, and C1 collinear, then what you end up with is this special boy called the complete quadrilateral. What is the complete quadrilateral? Um, this time with a little bit more confidence, the complete quadrilateral is uh, this thing that keeps coming up over and over again. It is a certain configuration that appears when four lines kind of meet each other in six collinear points. Okay, so I think I'm doing this correctly. Um, <coughs> it's called the complete quadrilateral because all lines intersect all of the lines. Wait, who who is the expert on this, Stephen? It's 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 B, C1, B1, and C, which are referred to as the four points, right? Yeah, you just extend, yeah. You just extend all the sides until every intersection possible is created. But, yes. the the but the four, but the four vertices are, or it doesn't matter actually, kind of in a certain sort of way, which of the four vertices. I think it doesn't matter. So I'll just, I'll just, I'll just sort of think of it as like this. Yeah, no, so, it's just like, yeah, it's, it's what you're highlighting right now. I don't think there's anything else. There. Okay. If you did so, anything else, it'd be different. There'd okay. Be so this is like a quadrilateral. Agree. And now I shall complete the quadrilateral, so to speak. And to complete the quadrilateral, you now let the sides like extend out until they all meet each other. Okay, now you might be thinking, what if they don't meet because it's a parallelogram? Mm, we're not going to worry about that because we think eventually we're going to let all parallel lines meet. So if it makes you feel better, let it be uh, a quadrilateral in which um, no sides are parallel to any other sides, if that makes you feel better. Well, in that case then, opposite sides of this quadrilateral will meet each other. And here now, do you see this extension is happening? And uh, this one meets over here. Okay, so this is one way of thinking about a complete quadrilateral. It's what you take. It's what you get when you take a regular quadrilateral whose uh, whose opposite sides are not parallel, and you extend those sides out until they meet. Okay, and what you end up with is a configuration of four lines in which there are certain collinearities. Right? So there are three points on each line, and there are four total lines. Cool? Okay. So, this is a pretty good class so far. All right. 
close that up, back over here, get some tea. Note that we're only halfway through going over the first of four write-ups that I posted on Sunday. Yeah, well, um, surely the theorem continues to hold in this case. If you don't believe me, we could do it. Do you want to do it? I kind of don't want to, but you should. This is page six of your Mikel points packet. Do you want to do it? I could just do it really quick. Yes? Sure. Okay, let's do it for the other figure. In other words, you might be worried that by introducing this collinearity, you might be worried that for some reason um, the theorem didn't hold anymore. Um, so I'm here to tell you that it does. So ignore all this text over here, and let's just go through the sort of repetitive but still of educational value argument that indeed you get these three circles. Oh, and before I do this, of course, I should hide one of the circles. Which one do you want to hide? The red one. The red one, says somebody. It's gone. Okay, so, goodbye red circle. Let us bring you back to life. How are we going to do it? Uh, well, um, we're just going to do it. I don't know what to do. La, la, la. I guess we begin by drawing uh, lines from P to each of the three vertices, uh, or to each of the three points, rather. So I'm going to draw PB1, oh, PA1, and PC1. Also, I'll call this um, alpha, and call this beta, and I'll call this gamma. Let me try to do this my own way this time. It's more satisfying. What am I trying to do? I'm trying to show that C1P B1A is um, cyclic. Yeah? Yeah? So, one maybe simple way of doing this is... That's 180 minus alpha. So I guess I really just need to show that that's alpha. Why is that alpha? Well, um, of course. Inscribed angles on blue circle. Okay. So that means this is gamma. That's gamma. Cyclic quad on green circle for beta. So C1P A1 is 180 minus beta. C1P A1 is, so, okay, I see what you guys are saying. So um, this big angle here is obviously just 180 minus beta. Yeah. So this crap is just not hard after you do it like five times or once, depending on who you are. So that's 180 minus beta. So, yeah, 180 minus beta minus gamma just is alpha. That's just like a math fact. Thus, we have shown that, um, that uh, A, C1, P, B1 is, uh, is cyclic. Uh, and so the red circle exists. Cool? Okay, that's kind of worth it, maybe. All right, close you. Go back over here. Okay, so there's no reason to be like suspicious or whatever. Okay, this is, I believe, all we did. I think this is where class actually kind of ended on that day, I want to say, um, somewhere around here. Um, and I sort of just said, that's all there is to say. No, there is more to say. Um, okay, what is that thing that there is more to say? Well, what is this theorem? The theorem is that um, the three circles all meet. And the three circles all meet at this point P. Okay, I am now going to prove to you that in fact P is on the circumcircle of triangle ABC. That's important. Why is P on the circumcircle of triangle ABC? Well, because of these extra collinearities, we're going to do that thing that we always do with the, with the complete quadrilateral, which is um, focus on a different triangle. 
um, A1, B1, and C1 were chosen as arbitrary points on the side of ABC. But we could just as well, it's all still recording, we could just as well think of the um, uh, yellow triangle as primary, okay? And then think of B as an arbitrary point on side A1C. That's what I shall now do. Then, um, uh, again, thinking of the yellow triangle as primary, we will think of C as being an arbitrary point on side A1B1. And here, yeah. And then, finally, uh, A1 is an arbitrary point on the side of B1C1. And it's at that point that I'm crucially using the collinearity of A1B1C1. Okay, so this argument only works in the special case in which A1B1 and C1 are collinear. Are you with me? Okay, and now, simply apply the theorem, the theorem being that um, the Mikel point exists, but now for this yellow triangle and for the collection of arbitrary, I put that in air quotes, points on the sides of the yellow triangle, but specifically, this is why, because of complete quadrilateral magic, um, of course, remember, in the original construction, A1 was chosen to be an arbitrary point on BC, so you automatically get that B, A1, and C are collinear. Okay, in other words, when you think of the yellow triangle as being the primary triangle, not only are B, A1, and C automatically points on the sides of that triangle, but also they're automatically collinear. Like say cool. Wait, can you like move the line like this? You can, but I don't want to. But yeah, you of course you can, right? A is A is free. I mean like B A one C, like the bottom line can you tilt around? A one C. Yes. I believe this particular oh, I had an idea for Sunday, but I'm forgetting it now. This particular figure was constructed in such a way that A, B, and C are free, and so is one of the points A1, B1, C1. I think P is free. No. Actually, C1 is free, and A1 is free. So you get two, you have two degrees of freedom. The only... What's up? I'm saying the bottom line isn't determined by the way of the triangle. You can move the bottom line around without... That's because of the way that you could also move constructed starting from the yellow triangle and the bottom line. This particular GeoGebra file has been constructed with one particular restriction. The restriction is that A1B wouldn't see one be collinear. Okay? Thus, um, A1 and C1 are free in this particular figure. When I say free, I mean free to be anywhere on line AB. But then B1 is not free because you have to make all three points collinear. Does that help at all? Okay. But the, but the thing I was getting at a minute ago is that once you fix A1, B1, and C1 as being collinear and focus again on this different triangle, this yellow triangle, then automatically the three points B, A1, and C become not only three points on the sides of the yellow triangle, but three collinear points on the sides of the yellow triangle. So you can now turn around and say, all right, because you have triangle ABC and three uh, points A1, B1, and C1 uh, on the sides of triangle ABC, then these three circles, red, blue, and green, all meet at P. But also, if you instead look at the yellow triangle, then, I want to like hide all the circles now, but I don't know how. Here we go. So now, what does the, what does the Mikel, what does the, the theorem, say about this yellow triangle. It says that, now we have to be careful, the circle through one of the vertices of the yellow triangle and the two other points chosen on the sides of that angle, that would be B1 and A1. There's a circle through them. Is everybody with me? So the green circle is one of the circles um, under discussion when it comes to the yellow triangle. What's the other circle under discussion when it comes to the yellow triangle? It's the one through that vertex, B1, and 
the two other points on the side of angle B1. And the, the, in other words, line B1, C1. So that other point is A1. And uh, the point on line A, B1 is C. Okay, so the McKell points theorem as applied to the yellow triangle and vertex B1 uh, says that there will be a circle through B1, A1, and C. That is the blue circle. Okay, what's the third circle under discussion? It's the circle through A and the two points on the sides of the yellow triangle, on, uh, specifically on the sides of angle A in the yellow triangle. Well, what is that? What's the point, on the, what's the point of the yellow triangle on side uh, AC1? A, a C1, A C1 is one of the sides of the yellow triangle. What's the point chosen on side A C1? B. B. And the other side of the yellow triangle is A B1. What's the point on side A B1? C. C. In other words, um, the the other the third circle in reference to the yellow triangle is the circle through A B and C. Oh, and it must go through P. So and it must go through P. So when you apply, when you have this complete quadrilateral configuration in which A1, B1, and C1 are collinear, then the first part of the argument tells you that, there's, that there is a McKell point where the green, blue, and red circles all meet. And the second part of the argument, by changing what is the triangle and what are the points on the sides of that triangle, you can repeat the argument and conclude that the McKell point for this yellow triangle is the point where the green, uh, blue, and um, gray circles meet, but that's also P. Okay, conclusion. When the three points are collinear, the McKell point is guaranteed to be on the certain circle. Or, as Coxeter puts it, when the points A1, uh, B1, and C1 are collinear, the circumcircle of, and then he just lists the four triangles, but the four triangles are the same three triangles we keep talking about plus triangle ABC. Okay, who's with me? Lexi, is that a question or that's a yeah, question? Um, is this just like a converse Simpson line? It is related to the Simpson line, but notice, good question. Um, he's saying, hey, this kind of reminds me of a Simpson line. What exact, by the way, this is what we call theorem 3.34. So we're like two-thirds of the way down, page 62 now. This is not necessarily a Simpson line. After all, and I think I start rambling about this somewhere. Um, blah, 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 there's a lot going on here. Um, okay. Uh, did I promise that we would make this live? No, somewhere I did. Um, so, 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 so. So is this a Simpson line? No, not necessarily. Because there's no reason to believe, in fact, it's pretty clear that PB1 is not perpendicular. Right? It's only a Simpson line when B1 is the foot of the perpendicular from P to AC. But here it is not. So this is more general than the Simpson line. The Simpson line is a special case of this. Okay, I'm gonna have, I have more, I say that in a subsequent paragraph, so can I wait on that? Okay, because now, seemingly out of nowhere, but it doesn't make sense in his weird coxeter brain to start talking about Simpson lines now, because it, it kind of, the flow is there, it's just not so, you have to just be very, very uh, up on things to see it. Uh, here we are, the argument shifts in the second last paragraph, talking about Simpson lines and oblique Simpson lines. Okay, um, so, the Simpson line, as Alexei was just asking about, is kind of a special case. It's two things at once. On the one hand, the Simpson line is a special case of the conversation from 15 minutes ago about pedal triangles. On the other hand, the Simpson line is the special case of this theorem that we were just discussing, in which A1, B1, and C1 are not arbitrary uh, collinear points, but specifically the feet of the perpendiculars. Okay, so should we, we should see the Simpson line discussion as a joint special case of these two separate things we've been considering. Who's doing thing? A lot going on here. All right. La, la, la. So, what did I say next? Yeah, blah, blah, blah. Okay, so this is a special case of five where P happens to be a pedal point. 
where P is the pedal point. Oh, but now the pedal triangle is degenerate. In other words, it's a Simpson line. So if you already feel the Simpson lines are just degenerate pedal triangles, you should, then of course, considering the Simpson line and how it relates to the Mikel point is just a generalization of that discussion of pedal triangles. But you can also see it as a special case over here, but now um, there are, we have right angles. Okay, so this is, I felt I did not have this deep level of understanding. Uh, certainly last week I didn't, but I didn't even have it two years ago as I was watching my own video um, recorded you know, uh, during Zoom school. I didn't have this quite level of understanding, but I think I do now, which is take a triangle ABC. Take a point on the serpent circle. From that point, there's exactly one Simpson line. Fact. But there are an infinite number of lines. Uh, I said, we'll make this live. There are an infinite number of lines to the sides of triangle ABC make it with. So let's just, if I said I was going to do it, let's just do it. Let's just make a quick GeoGebra file. Oh my god, it's taking 90 minutes. Am I going too slow or kind of just right, given the circumstances? Just about right. All right. That makes me feel better. Thanks, Jason. Um, the hell am I doing? Uh, from here. Alright, so, making a triangle, triangle time, A, um, B, uh, C, and there's a triangle. Okay, so now, <coughs> um, yeah, we'll do this. And we'll do this. Um, so, then, just for clarity, Sean, um, just for clarity, let's make the, uh, well, what, what am I talking about? Let me make the circle through these three points, circle through three points, ABC. Okay, and so now we have a arbitrary point P. And this arbitrary point P on the circum circle, now, of course, does everyone agree that there's exactly one Simpson line? Because there are exactly, um, there's exactly one, for a given point on the circum circle, there's exactly one point. Um, <coughs> um, Such that P to that point is perpendicular. Exactly, yeah, there's exactly, there's only one perpendicular to be dropped from P to each of the sides of the triangle. However, there are an infinite number of lines through um, through an arbitrary point. Yeah, I've sort of lost my train of thought, I guess. What, what the hell am I trying to say now? If you, There's a... If you choose an arbitrary point and then choose to... and then make a line through it... No, but I want to make... Um, what I want to do now is I want to make... I want to remake this figure, but now I want P to be free. P is free. No, in this figure it isn't. But in my figure I'm making right now, I want it to be free. So I guess I just want to drop... No, I guess I just want... An arbitrary point on one of the lines, and then create a second arbitrary point on another one of the lines, then a line through them. And then those will. No, wait, that doesn't work quite how I, I thought it would. Um, okay, wait. Let me start, and if I screw up, so be it. So uh, let me just prove, choose an arbitrary point C1 on line AB. Um, and now, C1. Okay. And now, what I want to be the case is that what? So now I can make the circle through a C1 and P. Uh, a C1 P. I'm trying to make the circle. I'm trying to make. Oh, la, 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 la. Yeah, you're. you're I think I'm doing this right, but I'm just not with confidence. But that doesn't mean I'm wrong. I think it's just that you clicked the wrong button. Or circle. I did. Thing. That also is one thing that happened. Um, so what is this? This is a circle. Through, yeah, here we go. This is a circle through A, C1, and P. 
And now, so this is like one of my circles, you know, whatever. Maybe it's like blue and, you know, blah, blah, blah. And, um, you know, it's going to be one of those guys. True? Okay, so now, well, what does that mean? That means that the point of intersection of that circle with line A, like that's my other point. In fact, what is that point? B1. That's B1. So true. And now, okay, uh, this point is like slightly subtle, but I think this is kind of worth it, or this was I was I intended to do on Sunday. Now, I draw the line through B1 and C1, and wherever it meets here is becomes A1. Who's with me? Okay, so the point I'm making, which is maybe not so hard to understand, is that for a given point P on the circumcircle of ABC, there are an infinite number of lines uh, A1, B1, C1 that are collinear that meet, that meet the sides of the triangle for which P is the Mikel point. Okay, and you know, if you, I can also do the rest of these if you want. Uh, of course, the way I have constructed this, um, I hope I've done this correctly, then C, uh, B1, yeah, that's going to pass through P, and um, B, C1, uh, A1 is also going to pass through P. In other words, um, P is the Mikel point for this configuration, red, you know, thick, blah, blah, green, thick, blah, blah. No, that's the circle circle. So this is the other one. Um, la, la, la. And we could also give this one the same treatment. Cha, cha. Okay, cool. Um, but the point is, this is no different, in a static sense, this is no different from the previous figure. But in the previous figure, uh, P couldn't vary. Now, does everyone sort of see that for any point on the circumcircle, there are an infinite number of lines, but there's only one Simpson line? That was kind of all I was trying to say there. Okay. Woo. More. Uh, yeah, so then um, you can uh, just, whoa. Um, you can just uh, take, you, we, there's not really like a lot to say here uh, because we've already handled the case in which A1, B1, and C1 are collinear. And so the Simpson line is simply a special case of that collinearity. And therefore, um, for the point P on the circumcircle uh, that generates that Simpson line, that will be the Mikel point for these three sets of circles. Okay, good? Say good. Okay, then he has more things to say. He says, all right, um, no. Then he says, well, since a Simpson line is just a degenerate pedal triangle, you can basically repeat all the logic from before with the rigid rotations, and you can make an oblique Simpson line. Okay, so this is the oblique Simpson line. It's the Simpson line, it's the line that you get from rotating your old Simpson line in a certain kind of sense, in the same sense as before, right? In the same sense as you keep the angular spacing between PC1, PB1, and PA1 the same, and you rotate, not to repeat all that logic because I thought we did it quite well, then you get three points and wherever they meet the sides of the triangle, you call that your oblique Simpson line. Okay, now the oblique Simpson line is a special case of the collinearity of A2, B2, and C2. Not every line A2, B2, C2 is an oblique Simpson line. Because what's the property of an oblique Simpson line? The property is that these three angles are the same. The three angles being, uh-oh, they don't look the same. What are the three angles that are the same? Uh, a, a, P, C1, B, P, B2, Wait, if I set A to be 0, then it's going to look like good. But if I set B to be like 10, then P, P, C, 2, A would then be changed. Specifically, it would be 100. Yeah. In this case, right? I'm just doing a bunch of geometry in my head. If you can't keep up, sorry. And also P, B, 2, C would be 100. Mm -hmm. And also P, A, 2, C would be 100. Yeah. Okay, so you can define an oblique Simpson line as a line in which P, 
C2, uh, basically in which the three points A2, B2, and C2, and connected to the line P, make equal angles with the size of the triangle. Okay, good. Um, yeah, that's all I gotta say about oblique Simpson lines. Um, yeah, okay, moving on. Theorem 3.35, by contrast, is like super chill. Now, <coughs> we just again uh, take this figure uh, that we've already seen before. By previous argument, um, <coughs> the, the, remember these three triangles, the mostly green, the mostly orange, and the mostly red triangle are all similar to each other. And then there's this follow-up. The follow-up is, we already have done this together in class twice, so I probably should do it again. But anyway, here I am. The argument is, hey, consider um, the circle through the mostly red and the circle through the mostly green. They meet at points B and F. Thus, line BF is the radical axis of those two circles. Thus, will be perpendicular to the line through the centers. So then, let me just drop a little point right here, calling it X, and a little point right here, calling it Y. And what can I say about this uh, point X? Well, I know that FB is perpendicular to O103, and I know that um, here as well, uh, that FC, uh, by a similar argument, is perpendicular to O102. But then that makes this a right angle, O1XF, and it also makes FY01 a right angle. Who's with me? And so you get this cutie cutie little um, cyclic quad. The fact that it's cyclic is not particularly important, but what is important is that the opposite angles are supplementary. Um, and so since, since P, B, F, C is cyclic, then this big angle F here is supplementary to this angle P, but then um, so is this angle supplementary to, uh, to, to F. Thus, this angle right here is also P. Get it, get it? Okay, so that's why the, th the conclusion of this theorem is that the three, uh, that the triangle of centers, because you, you repeat that argument with O2, you repeat that argument with O1, the triangle of centers of the circumcircles is similar to the original triangle. Okay, who's good? Okay, so then, um, finally, 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 you say, um, hey, if it should happen to be that the three triangles are equilateral triangles, then also the circles of centers is equilateral. Okay, that was where class ended on 1102. But wait, there's more. What happened on 1106? 1106 was kind of a wild day. Here, I said, hey, we can't put this off any longer. You did these problems two weeks ago. Let's put them all up on the board. You guys were completely dead that day. I was dead too. I couldn't tell whether only 30% of you had done the problems. I couldn't tell whether you thought the problems were easy and didn't deserve going over. I had not done the problems myself, so I had nothing important to say. We just kind of zombie walked through a 40 minutes of going over this problems. Then, we got to, then I passed out a packet. This packet, unfortunately, was not so good. Um, the packet was us trying to prove the fact that the inner Napoleon triangle is equilateral. And basically, I sat over there, and me and um, Alex and Sarah Stone did it. Sarah Stone was unhappy, and partially she was unhappy because um, once we tried to start following um, Coxeter's argument, it immediately became clear that the figure I had provided for the class was not a good figure because it did not include the outer Napoleon triangle and that Coxeter's method for concluding that the inner Napoleon triangle was equilateral is to compare it directly side by side with the outer Napoleon triangle and in fact to show that each of the sides of the inner Napoleon triangle is a certain ratio of the sides of the outer Napoleon triangle. And so I made a new figure which supports this argument better and if you want to be awesome, I do. Um, I mean, I'm already awesome, but I try to be even more awesome. I am going to redo my argument that I did successfully on 11.06, but this time writing it out more clearly and with confidence and good handwriting 
Uh, but I'm going to do it on this figure instead. So find your color printer and um, print this figure, and then try to follow what Coxeter does on page 64. Or literally move on with your life is another option. What else happened? Um, I passed, I said, hey everyone, try to do the 3.3 problems right now is what I did. And some of you tried that, and some of you were successful, but I wasn't really paying attention. Um, so, but I want you to like do these 3.3 problems now. So if you never did them, now's the time to do them. Hey, I did a lot of the hard work for you because um, the very first problem, 65 number one, says, uh, if squares are erected on two sides of a triangle, check, check, uh, their circumcircles intersect on the circle whose diameter is the third side. Wait, what? The circumcircles intersect on the diameter. Boy, I, I lost myself for a second. The circumcircles intersect on the diameter is the third side. Um, How come I don't understand the sentence? If squares are erected on two sides of a triangle, the circumcircles of those squares intersect on the circle. Oh, whose diameter is the third side? Okay, so in other words, um, you have to show that the circle through this square and the circle through this square besides being at point A, meet at this other point here, currently unlabeled, and that that point is on the circle whose diameter is the third side of the triangle. Okay, so why do we know that that's true? Well, it would suffice, um, I thought that this proof was like almost trivial, but I guess I could be wrong. Um, Oh, I know what to do. Instead of thinking of them as squares, think of, think of them as isosceles right triangles. Because then you get to use the theorems. Specifically, if you, instead of thinking of this circle over here as the circle through this square, think of it as the circle through A, B, E, where A, B, E is, is an isosceles right triangle, like a, like a 45, 45, 90 triangle. And same thing over here. Well then, um, not sure what the hell this purple thing is though doing down there. Yeah, why is it arbitrary though? That's not what I was thinking. Yeah, I know it's 90, but it's not a 45, 45, 90. I kind of wanted it to be. It's probably the reflection of the point. No, it appears to be just free. Who knows? Whatever. Moving on. No, 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 no. I don't want to move on. Oh, wait, no. River's whispering things, but he's saying something deep. Um, he's saying that, I think, River, is this what you're saying? That if I make this, if I drag this point I to be like that, that's what I actually wanted. Remember, you're supposed, to con you're supposed to erect the three triangles on the sides in an alternating fashion, right? Like alpha, the three angles of the similar triangle need to end up being the three exterior, the, th the three far away angles. So now, this point I should have been here. In other words, I want to make 45, 45, 90 triangles on the sides of triangle ABC, but I want this one to be a 45, this one to be a 45, and this one to be a 90. I think I know, and I think that's correct, right? And therefore, do I get to just automatically apply the theorem that says that? Yeah. I think you do. The inner thing is equal outer. That the point exists. No, that the Mikkel point exists. Yes. My logic is a little questionable here, or probably it's right, but I'm, it's not clear in my brain. But um, it would probably help to like hide some of these circles that are that are um, like that one? Yes. Because the goal is to show 
that um, they all meet at this point L. Okay? So, what's required, I think I'm doing this correctly, is I am supposed to make this purple triangle in this specific ratio of 44, 45, 90, and then I'm supposed to cite the theorem to say that the circumcircles of all of these meet on the, oh yeah, 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 that the circumcircles of all three of these triangles all meet at the Macau point. And since this is a 45, 45, 90 triangle, the circumcircle of BIC is the circle whose diameter is BC. Yeah, there we go, that all works. Yo. Alternatively, you can just like draw it. Wait, hold on, wait, before you give me alternatively, and then also, the centers of the three circles are the vertices of another isosceles right triangle. Well, I just get that automatically from the theorem that we were just discussing, right? That the triangle of centers is similar to the original triangle. Okay, get it? Yeah, if you just like draw ELB and LC, it's the angle chase. And you find that BLC is 90 degrees, and you're done. Because you know that, like... Okay, wait, 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 hold on. Well, I want to finish this 1106, because then we get to page 65, number 2. This is a just a truly evil problem in which Coxeter is like, first of all, um, I'm just calling this problem three parts for no particular reason. Any normal person would require three separate high-quality diagrams for it. I'm giving you nothing. Good luck. F you, also. Okay, well, I, because I'm a nice and wonderful person made three separate large diagrams all in color which help you through the three different parts of number two. Also, this is a quality solution, so you have to do it. So, page 65, number two, part one, use this diagram. And I think this ends up being like, not so hard. Page 65, number two, part two, I have eliminated all extraneous things and given you only this. The goal is to show that these three black lines all meet. You're going to use converse Cheva in a way that's very not obvious, but if you follow Coxeter's hints in the back of the book, he pretty much tells you what to do, so it becomes then not so hard. Cool? You trust me, you can do it. And then, we are, I was going to do it today in class, just all with us, but we're not going to. Then, part uh, 65, number 2, part 3, asks you to show that a different um, three lines are all meet. And that is essentially to show that um, this is all the specific case in which these triangles are equilateral, right? This doesn't hold in general. But in the specific case when these triangles are all equilateral, then we need to show that these three lines, the pink line, the orange line, and the purple line, all meet at F. And the way to do that, I believe, is to construct F as the Mikel point, and then, um, you know, don't assume that A, F, and P are collinear, uh, or that R, F, and C are collinear, or that B, F, and Q are collinear, and then take it from here. And basically, you got a lot of 60 degree angles out there, and I'll, actually, I'll just tell you that if you can show that this angle plus this angle plus this angle is 60, which is not so hard to do. Sorry, if you can show that each of, I think it turns out that each of these are 60 for various reasons, then that shows that A, F, and P are collinear, and then you just take them there. Let's say, is that like a, yeah, this is easy? Yeah. Okay, cool. So that concludes 1106 day. And then you're going to do a bunch, you're going to hand in a bunch of homework, by the way. What happened again? On Wednesday, there was also a day, I know the bell's about to ring, but this day I thought we did pretty chill. We did Menelaus, we went outside, we proved converse Menelaus, we did these problems, and then we did Pappas hexagon theorem, and then we proved Pappas' hexagon theorem outside. That was Wednesday. Then Friday, almost up to date, what did we do? Also, this was a coherence class. We um, proved the angle bisector theorem. We went over these problems from section 3.4 on Menelaus. Um, one of the Glow girls did this proof about Pops' hexagon theorem section. Then, this is a hard problem that we need to talk about. We did the Sark's theorem, and I mentioned Pascal's theorem. Okay, so, have we turned all these frowns upside down? Kind of. Kind of. Um, now it's time for you to go do a lot of homework and maybe read all these write-ups a little bit more carefully.
Uh, but presumably you did the 3 1 and 3 2 homework already a long time ago, so you just need to do the 3.3 homework. I believe in you. And um, then next class, which is Thursday, we'll actually finish chapter 3 by learning about Ryan Chong's theorem. Last thing to do. Cool? All right, goodbye, everyone. Good class. Goodbye, people at home. If you actually watched this whole thing, that's incredible. Anyone want to say goodbye?